All right, let me tell you what we're going to be doing right now with uh, my friend John Burke. He's been a friend of mine for uh, over 20 years. He started church in Austin, Texas, same time I started Crossroads uh, that started in Cincinnati. And he's gone on to uh, exceed me in a bunch of different areas. One of them is in writing. Like he actually makes the New York Times bestseller list with, uh, with uh, Imagine Heaven. I had him on my podcast, The Aggressive Life. I had a bunch of people on my podcast. Matthew McConaughey, I had him on my podcast. He was the most listened to podcast I had. And then John came along and blew by him in about three weeks. And it still grows because this message of heaven being real and talking with people, John has interacted with 2,000 people. He's the foremost authority in the world on near-death experiences. Nobody has spoken firsthand with 2,000 people who have gone to the next level, the next realm, and come back. He has. And he understands the scriptures. He makes ties that are just amazing. But of all those folks, he's got 70 stories inside of his new book, Imagine the God of Heaven. Let's look at a couple of them. I grew up in Council of Iowa in a Jewish family. My dad's an atheist, a hardcore atheist. My mom's an agnostic. Despite my parents, I had always believed in God, always. It was spring and I was 16. My horse reared up, fell over backwards, and as she hit my chest, I immediately left my body. I was up 30, 40 feet in the air. I just left. I knew I was dead. There was a light over my shoulders and it was illuminating everything in front of me. As my Hindu belief, I thought if I die, then that should be it. Maybe I'll come back as another, another living thing in this life. But it did not happen. I heard code blue, code blue. I asked the doctors what, what actually happened. He said, well, they could not revive your heart. A bright light was appearing before me. I knew that light had superior authority, superior power. I knew it was a divine light. I fell in love with that light. I was born in Rwanda to the parents with the different ethnic backgrounds. One Otto, another one Tutsi, mixing with the Islam and the tradition uh, ancestry worship. I was diagnosed by blood cancer. The doctor said that uh, this cancer is on fourth stage and they cannot be here. When I died, I found myself in a very big, in a very big room, a bathroom in. His white garment was very shiny, shiny, that kind of sunshine pierced in my eyes. When all the COVID situation was happening and I was extremely sick, I just knew that I was going to die. And I started floating on top of my husband's head. And I'm looking at my body. I was just like, am I dead? And I started screaming, God, please forgive me. Because I realized he was real. In that moment, I knew that there was something missing. This light pops bold, like seeing the sun without burning. I knew that that was the voice of God because of the authority and the love. It was like, I am who created you. I just knew that I was made by this. Hey, welcome Crossroads. Great to be back. Great to... I want to welcome everybody that, uh, that are online, the different campuses. And you just heard from some of the people that I have interviewed who clinically died. You know, no heartbeat, brain waves stopped. And yet when they were resuscitated, they came back talking about a life more real than this one in a place far more beautiful and in the presence of a God of light and love who they never wanted to leave. And now I know what some of you are already thinking. You're thinking, oh, now this is just weird. This guy talks to dead people. No, I talk to them when they're alive again. And it's actually way more normal than you would ever imagine. Do you know that in 2019, a study was done by the European Academy of Neurology across 35 countries, and they found that 5% of the population when clinically dead had what's called a near-death experience, like these people you heard from. I mean, that's millions of people all over the globe. And I believe that God is giving testimony 
of global evidence of his great love and grace offered to all nations. But if you're still skeptical, I get it. Because when I first started studying these, I was a skeptical engineer. My dad was dying of cancer. Someone gave him the very first research on near-death experiences, and I saw it by his bedside table, picked it up, read it in one night, and I said, oh my gosh, this God Jesus stuff may be real. I was an agnostic. And not long after that, I came to faith in Christ. And over the last 35 years, as Brian said, I've, I've studied thousands of these near-death experiences. And in 2015, I wrote a book, Imagine Heaven, showing how the commonalities of these experiences perfectly align with what the Bible's been telling us about the afterlife all along. And recently, I wrote this book, Imagine the God of Heaven, because of all the people I interviewed, they would say consistently, of all the wonders and beauty of heaven, of all the glorious reunions, nothing could compare to being in the presence of God. He is the love you've always wanted. And if you don't believe that, I, I want to stretch your imagination today. You know, this new book is really uh, about God. Um, and some of you may be saying, but how do you know that this is true? I mean, how do you know these experiences are true? How do you know they're not hallucination or like endorphins flooding the brain or, or anoxia, lack of oxygen? You're just a trick. The brain is playing as, as we die. And I deal with all of those uh, alternate theories in, in chapter two, and I list the 10 points of evidence that convince me as a skeptical engineer, but also have convinced many skeptical medical doctors that this is grounded in reality. Like, for instance, when people die, they are out of their bodies, but they still are in the room watching the resuscitation, and they can see things happening that later when they come back can be verified. And statistically, they're like 98% accurate. Second, uh, blind people, when they have a near-death experience, they can see, and they see all the same things that sighted people do. And then when people die, many times on the other side, they meet a deceased person that they didn't even know had died until they come back. And seven other points of evidence. But let me ask you a question. Has God just started revealing himself like this across the globe in our age of modern medical resuscitation and NDEs? Of course not. And what I'm really trying to show in this new book is that the Bible is actually God's love story. The Bible is God's love story for all nations from the very beginning that God created every person for a love relationship with himself. But all of us at some point, we push God away. We reject his love. And yet from the beginning, 4,000 years ago, before any world religion was put down in a sacred writing, God calls Abraham and Sarah and says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And through the Jewish nation, God foretells through his, his prophets that he's gonna send this Messiah who will be the savior of all the world. And then Jesus comes and he dies for the sins of the whole world. And then in the last book of the Bible, John says he's taken up into heaven and he sees a vast crowd, too great to count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing in front of the throne and before the lamb, before Jesus. And then it says, there's a great wedding. It's bizarre and mysterious, but you see, the Bible is really God's love story. He's in love with all people of all nations. And he also says, when you, will see, if, when you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I'm gonna let you hear from, there, there's 70 NDE testimonies that I interviewed from all across the globe in the new book, Imagine the God of Heaven. But I want you to hear how these things are true. So I've brought eight of them on video. So watch some of them. My dad had a mantra. There is no God. There is no heaven. There is no hell. Jesus Christ is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. My heart hit my chest. I was up 30, 40 feet in the air. I realized there was a person standing right there and he moved forward and I looked at him and he looked at me and it's like, oh Jesus. I was not thinking, what is a nice Jewish girl like me seeing Jesus? No, I knew this man. I saw him from the time I was formed in my mother's womb, he had been with me. You know, just when I used to talk to God at night when I was a little kid, 
he'd been there. He'd been there sitting by my bed. I saw that. I can't explain how God can be a light and God can be a man and God can be love. I, I can't explain it. I can't. But that's what I experienced. They even called me, Karina, come, come. They were celebrating me. I'm like, me? Out of everybody? And I kept saying, God, I don't deserve you. I'm filthy. Send me back to hell. I knew I was going there. And he said, come, I love you. I knew I was home. That is home. When I died, I found myself in a very big, in a very big room. A person entered. He's wearing a, 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 a white garment with the sandals, you know, holding his hand, you know, showing them to me with the very, these very big holes into his heart. He told me, I died for me. You are among those I died for. Never deny it again and tell this to everyone. I woke up, people had come for party. So I started shouting, Jesus is in in front of you. I'm seeing him. He is there. He's the one who has brought me back. I fell in love with that light because it was protecting me from any harm, taking me somewhere safer. The light stopped and I saw that light was shining on top of a beautiful compound. Inside that compound or complex, I should say, is there's a lot of mansions, big buildings, absolutely gorgeous, square shaped. It is very high walls. And I saw there's 12 magnificent gates there, beautiful gates, many angels there. They're protecting that gate. I knew I was looking at the kingdom of heaven. I saw there was a huge throne. And on that throne, there was the Almighty. I knew he was the Almighty. I knew it automatically. His eyes were like lightning bolts. And all the sins I committed in my life was flushed before my eyes. So I kept repeating the same thing. That Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me. And then finally, he spoke to me. His voice was full of tenderness, mercy, and the grace. He said, I'm sending you back to the earth. When the Lord spoke to me, I experienced the love, tenderness from him that I did not expect. Just a few short distance from him on the on that platform level, I saw a very narrow door or a narrow gate that was open. And that is the only gate through whom I can enter into the kingdom of heaven. I asked the Lord, Lord, when you see me again, please tell me how I can go to this narrow door. This next time when you see me, Lord, I want to go to the narrow door. Why would a 16-year-old Jewish girl who grew up hearing that Jesus was a hoax see Jesus when she dies and know that he was the God she had prayed to her whole life? And, and how do you explain why a Muslim imam would come back from this beginning of a hellish experience at his burial proclaiming that Jesus saved him and today he's an Anglican pastor who's had seven attempts on his life because he will not shut up about Jesus. And how do you explain a Hindu manufacturing engineer describing the exact same city of God that John describes in Revelation chapter 21 when he said that the Spirit took me to a great high mountain and he showed me the holy city. It shone with the glory of God. The city wall was broad and high with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels. It was square as wide as it was long. And Santosh came back seeking God with all his heart. He was like, this, is, this was not like the Hindu gods I learned about. Who was this God of tenderness and mercy and love and compassion? And he kept praying, God, I wanna know you, who are you? And two years later, his daughter, 
who was a, a choral major in college, was invited by a friend to sing in a choir at Easter in a church. Santosh goes to hear her. When he walks into the church, he feels the presence of this loving God. And here's what the message was on that day. Matthew chapter seven, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. And John chapter 10, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. And Santosh said, told me he went home, started reading the Bible and said, everything I experienced was in there. How do you explain this? And I'll tell you, friends, God brought me testimony, 70 people that I've put in the book from every continent, from Tehran, Singapore, India, China, Africa, Australia, all over the globe, they are testifying about the same God. And what Peter discovered when God saw the heart of Cornelius, a Roman soldier, and sent Peter to tell him about Jesus. And Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. And this is the message of good news. And Peter goes on to explain what Jesus did. Jesus is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Now, sometimes I find this confuses Christians. They say things to me like, well, are you saying that everyone goes to heaven? No. No, in fact, near-death experiencers, of those who come forward, 23% come forward talking about a hellish experience they had. Half the people you're seeing in these videos today, they first had started seeing a hellish reality before they saw a heavenly reality. And this is a very important thing to understand. NDEs are not eternity. It, 30% of NDEers say there was a border or boundary in their experience. They knew they couldn't cross and still come back to earth. And what that means is they have not crossed over into either eternal life or eternal death. Instead, this is just a peek into the reality of both. And we shouldn't be surprised that people who don't even know Jesus would, would see God. After all, think about the apostle Paul. He didn't believe in Jesus. He was having Christians arrested and, and persecuted. In Acts chapter nine, he's on the Damascus road and the same brilliant God of light appears to him that appeared to all these indie ears. And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. Notice something, Jesus does not explain the gospel to him. He later sends Ananias to explain it to him because Paul still had a free will. And Paul could either turn and follow Jesus, but he had a lot to lose. He was a wealthy Pharisee. And that's the same with these NDE testimonies. They come back, they don't always understand fully, but when they seek, they find. But they still have a free will, they still have a choice to make. Now, what these NDEers are, I think, is more like if I visited Buckingham Palace, right? I can see the place, I can visit the place, but that doesn't mean the royal family is ready to adopt me and have me move in forever. And that, I believe, is what these NDEs are, are like. All right, so what is God like? That's really what I spend the majority uh, of this new book talking about. And let me just say, those of us who know Jesus, we kind of think we know what God is like. But I want to challenge you because the truth is all of us put God in a box. We have to, we're finite. And so we have walls to how we imagine God. But the truth is God is far more mysterious and beautiful and powerful and majestic and all these big, huge words than you've ever imagined. But he's also far more relatable and personable and enjoyable and even fun. And maybe that hits the wall of your box I wanna challenge you to start to expand your thinking today. You know, what God wants is just honest relationship. And the more you understand how God feels about you, the more you're gonna to wanna to move toward him every single day. And I ask Lord, Lord, please tell me what I need to do to enter when you see me next time, I want to enter to them. He said, I want to see 
how honest how true how sincere you were with me 365 days a year not just once a week i want to see your relationship with me what's your relationship once you are back to your family i want you to love your family and love your children the wages of sin is death commit no more sins surrender yourself completely should underline completely unto me in your daily lives walk with me after this life review he took my hand and we flew we surfed It was like we had this wave of light under our feet and we were holding hands and flying like Superman and Lois Lane. So faster and faster and faster. And he was grinning from ear to ear. And it was the most fun thing I have ever done in my life. I saw a light and it was getting closer and closer. And it was, it's a living light. And it's the brightest thing you can imagine, but I could look at it. It's perfect. It's blemishless, infinite in its scope. And that light was love. and Jesus took me directly into the light and the next thing i knew i find found myself sitting on god's lap and i have a granddaughter a 2 year old granddaughter and you know if she needs comforting she'll sit on my lap and bury her her face in my chest and i'll put my arms around her and she'll, she'll have her arms around me that's what i was doing i was like a little kid and i buried my face against his chest and i put my arms around him and he had his arms around me and i never ever wanted to leave and everything in my body started shutting down we have the documentation and the timing that my heart and my lungs i was considered clinically dead for an hour and 45 minutes and i knew jesus christ is lord and savior i found myself leaving my body and going toward this light and i knew that's where jesus and the father is and i wanted to be with them and when i first came in i remember there was a forest right before me and when i got on the other side of the forest that's when i saw jesus christ he was real bright brighter than any light I've ever seen even the sun and probably what amazed me is I could look at him and I went down on my hands and knees and I said these words thank you 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 only reason I was there is because of what he had done somebody always said well did you see the nail prints i said i saw them but that's not what i was concentrating on what i was concentrating on is the love that everything was coming out of him for me like i was the only one he loved anybody i thought of in the, in the switch of my thinking all of a sudden i saw the love for them like he only loved them and i came to understand that god almighty goes out and creates love for us that only we can receive and that's what i was receiving that love that god had made for me now that light come, coming out of him i remember It wrapped itself around me. Someone asked me one time, "Was he hugging you?" I said, "Everything about him was hugging me." You know, God is far more personable and loving and relatable and even fun than you have ever imagined. You know, so many of us we 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 think God is like this killjoy, this party pooper. He doesn't he doesn't get us. He's he's distant and unrelatable. and nothing could be further from the truth. No one else gets you like he does. No one has been with you through it all except him. You know the scriptures tell us that Jesus understands our weaknesses for he faced all the same testings we do yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God and there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. You know, not only can God relate to you, but he's kind and he's merciful, just as Santosh and Swedik discovered. And you know, there's nothing too small and there's nothing too large that that God doesn't care about that you can take to him. You know, people will say, "Well, 8 billion people on the planet, he can't care about me, but that's how great he is." Not only does he care about you, there's no one else like you to him. And you know you think billions of people praying, he doesn't hear my prayers. He hears every single one and answers every prayer from your heart. And that's part of what I'm trying to stretch your mind to see God is mystery and majesty. He's far greater than you and I have ever imagined. And you know, the Bible talks about how 
God is imminent. He's always with us, but he's also transcendent. He's beyond it all. It says in Ephesians 4, there's one God and Father of all who is over all and in all and living through all. In other words, God is the very life force of you and of everything that that exists, and, and he's infinite. He's everywhere all the time, but he's also over all. He transcends, and he's beyond what he created. And you know, all those big words in in the Bible that you read, omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent and holy and eternal and infinite, you know, they all mean something, but we read them and we don't get it. But when you hear through through the words of these indie ears what that's like, you realize, oh my gosh. It's like this one 12 year old girl who had a near death experience. And, um, and, and she's there with Jesus. Interestingly, she said, sitting on his lap. And then she sees the glory and, and the majesty of God. And she said, all those big words, they mean something. And I experienced it. And all I could say is, whoa. <laughs> Just whoa. And what's also fascinating is this 12-year-old girl, Anne Heidi, she was 16, you know, when she encountered Jesus, both had no knowledge of the Bible, yet they experienced one God, but Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Wild, right? And, and you know, in, in the book, I talk about the, the Trinity and how these indie ears can help us. Because, you know, we hear the Trinity, one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, three persons. And that sounds like a contradiction to us, right? Because three persons can't be one. And, and so I use an analogy of... Imagine um, if I created a flat two-dimensional world, all right, and I stick my three fingers as a three-dimensional cre- creator into the, that world like this, they would see me as three round slices, right? They would see, they would see me like, can you go to the next one? Um, and the next one after that. They'd see me like that. Three round slices, right? But what if I told them I'm not actually three round slices, I'm actually one bean, But that would be a contradiction in their world because three round slices can never stack up an arm into one being because there is no up. There's only back and forth and side to side. So what if in our finite limited dimensions, it's a contradiction, but God, the Father, Son, and Spirit connect up somehow in dimensions far beyond ours or beyond dimensions. Funny little story is when I, w- I was in a writing deadline, and I thought, you know, I need a picture to explain this, and it was too late, but my son-in-law, Dom, is in high tech, and he's really good with computer graphics, and I called him. I said, hey, I need this, this computer graphic, and I need it tomorrow. Can you do it? And he said, sure, and he sends that to me, and it went in the book, and now the book's being translated in multiple languages and, and all that. And um, I thought that was computer generated. And he said, oh no, I was sitting in the bathroom. I just took a picture of my hand. <laughs> I was like, that, that's your real hand? And in the bathroom? You know? <laughs> and, uh, and so I joke with him now. I said, well, if high tech sales don't work out, you know, you now have experience as an international hand model. <laughs> he likes to say, I have a hand in that book. Dr. Ron Smotherman was a neurologist and psychiatrist that I interviewed. He was attacked by one of his patients who had a psychotic break, stabbed 13 times. He showed me the wounds even through his neck. And right before the 14th blow to his heart, he said, it was like time stopped and there before me was this divine God of light. Listen as first Dean and then Ron describe the mystery and the majestic qualities of this God. People always talk about a throne room. It wasn't a room like people think it is, because to me, I was, it was more of um, being out in nature. I was there when we all gathered around the throne of God to tell our Father how much we love Him. This was not my belief system. I didn't even know it was in, in the Bible at the time, but He sung a love song back to us, each and every one of us. When I was talking to Him, I was talking to Jesus and also the Holy Spirit. It wasn't like they were all together. 
but they, you could not separate them in the sense of communication. The fullness of the Father is inside Jesus. The fullness of the Holy Spirit is inside of Jesus. The fullness of Jesus is inside the Father. The fullness of the Holy Spirit is inside the Father. He is one. You know, it's not one like we think it's one. Some people say in the Trinity, you know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. No one thinks that way there. They're just one. When God shows up in your face like a bomb blast, it really gets your attention. And I'm standing there in awe with a, with a knife aimed at me, by the way, and time stopped. All I know is that God showed up as a light, and the light was roiling with energy, as you would expect if you were up close to, say, an, an atomic bomb. What was roiling even more was the love that came with it. It was, I'm sorry, I. I have a hard time talking about this. And in one single instant, all of his qualities were in my face. God's overarching quality is love. Everything is contained within that. His knowledge uh, came very suddenly as, as an image of a library filling the universe. His power was undisputable. The joy is it will make you happy for a lifetime. I can't think about it without getting full of joy. His authority is so great that um, you would follow any instruction. Kindness, um, you probably know someone who, is, someone who is kind. If you can imagine that kindness magnified a thousand times. Humor is, is something rather surprising. You don't expect God to show up ready to, to, to laugh it off. Purity, he is so pure. It puts your own condition in stark relief. You can see that you're not that. And there's, and there's humility. If I had his qualities, I would be so proud, you know, but he's not. He is humble. Such humility. Now Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then he said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle of heart. You know, friends, if you imagine God as this taskmaster, demanding, impossible to please, always wanting more from you, that's not God. You need to let him out of that box. And you need to imagine God as he actually is. He actually wants to walk with you to ease your burdens. He's humble and gentle. And as Ron noted, even humorous and fun. You know, God is joyful and enjoyable. Uh, do, does that stretch your imagination a little bit? Does it surprise you that I interviewed many people who said they laughed with God? And, and, you know, I'll be honest with you. When I first heard Heidi tell me about surfing this wave of light, like at the speed of light with Jesus, remember she was a 16-year-old when this happened. And, and I thought to myself, yeah, probably not. I don't believe everything everybody tells me. I wait to see, does, do, do many of them say the same thing? So I kind of just set it on a shelf and then I interviewed another young girl. She was 12 and she talks about with Jesus and in a similar way, kind of like flying and the funnest thing she's ever done. And then a little boy who was four years old who died in a hospital when he was little and kept telling his parents, I wanna go run and play with Jesus in the fields again. And suddenly I realized, why not? I mean, who do we think created us with the ability to enjoy life and adventure and pleasure? Do we think we made it all up? No. God is the most joyful, enjoyable being in the universe. C.S. Lewis says, joy is the serious business of heaven. And you know, we shouldn't be shocked. Do you know in the Old Testament, God had the nation of Israel throw seven street, national street parties, seven of them every year for like weeks at a time. And he said this, celebrate with joy before the Lord your God for seven days. And Jesus last night on earth, 
He said, I've told you these things so that you'll be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And you know, joy is actually your birthright if you are a child of God, if you've given your heart to Jesus. And indie ears remind us that joy is not dependent on circumstances. It's only dependent on you staying connected to the source, to God. And you stay connected very simply by prayer. And, and, and prayer is not some rote, you know, ritualistic thing. It's just talking to God from your heart. Do you know that indie ears tell us every prayer from your heart, doesn't matter how silly or trite or whatever, he hears it and he answers it. And do you know that every prayer is recorded in heaven as well? So that one day you'll see how God answered that for your good. And God is so good. You know, he desires to give you the desires of your heart. You know, Psalm 37, 4 says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And now I don't think that means if you're happy about God, you'll get the Lamborghini if you want it. You know, I don't think it means we get everything we want in this life, but I have interviewed so many indie ears that I've started to realize that in the life to come, God really does delight in giving us the desires of our heart. And the truth is, if you ever thought that following God would make you miss out on something, you're wrong. You won't miss out on anything. You know, Jim Woodford discovered that God is good even to those who don't deserve it. You know, he's a commercial airline pilot, owned several multi-million dollar businesses, very wealthy man. He had a, an airplane, a, a yacht, a horse farm, and 19 British sports cars in his garage, and none of that mattered when he died of an opioid overdose that he was taking for Guillain-Barre disease. And he told me, he said, you know, you know when you're dying. And he was sitting in his truck, and he suddenly had this realization that he was dying, and his wife was a Christian who had been praying for him. He had never prayed in his life. And suddenly he realizes, I've never thanked God for this life that I thought was my own making. And he realized it wasn't. And he said, as his head was hitting the steering wheel, he cried out, God, forgive me. I love to joke with Jim. I think you beat the thief on the cross for last minute conversion, buddy. <laughs> he said, that's who I identify with, actually. But listen, as, as Jim talks first about, many times I find when people last minute cry out to God, he first lets them see where they were going and then takes them to where they're going to be because of his forgiveness. But listen as Jim talks about the goodness of God, even when we don't deserve it. I knew I was dying, and I cried out, God, forgive me. In that nanosecond of death, I realized all that I had been given, all I had been blessed with, and I had never once thanked the Creator because I couldn't find proof of His existence. We talk about heaven is real, but so is hell. I cried out, God, help me, help me. I who should expect nothing because I gave him nothing, why should he help me? Because he's the God of never too late if you are contrite. I look, John, and these three magnificent beings are coming toward me. Very tall, luminous creatures, beautiful in every way. First one, who I later found out had been my guardian angel since my birth, since my conception. The tall angel came forward and said, would you walk with us? We walked down this beautiful 10 to 12 foot wide path lined with flowers that, of colors that I'd never seen. And I think what happens is God, God knows us each so intimately, he tailors our experience to the, the life we had on earth. So for me, when we rise up, and I'm looking down on the holy city. He gave me an aerial view of, of heaven, I suppose, because I was a pilot. And we came back down and resumed the walking, and, and I've always loved horses. The guardian said, James, look, and then behind a group of trees came three of the most magnificent horses I'd ever seen. And as I'm standing there, I look up in the sky of heaven, and I see these brilliant streaks of light going straight up. And I said, what are these? And the guardian said, those, James, are the prayers of your family for your soul, even now going toward God's throne. 
the angel said, every prayer you've ever issued, ever thought, ever contemplated is recorded in heaven. And it's not to create an I gotcha moment. When you have your life review, when you cross through the veil and you have your life review, it's to help you understand why you made the decisions you did. But I realized I hadn't seen the tall angel in a while. And so I turned to look and the tall angel was, was bowing very low and he was facing this other tall commanding figure. It was as though this golden liquid light flowed down all sides of this magnificent figure and the flowers that were already in bloom, when that golden light flowed over it, they bloomed again. And that light pooled around my feet, suddenly this knowledge of who I was looking at, and I'm looking none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God, someone that I thought was just a Jewish legend. And here I am looking at this magnificent being. And I realized then that he was re what the angel was holding up was the book of my life. And it's, it's no bigger than a cheap roadside diner menu. Mankind should have been my business and I was just so self-consumed. And, and I was overwhelmed with sadness, shame. Jesus turned toward me. And he smiled at me. He smiled at me. When I looked into those eyes, and I saw such sadness for the way I had lived my life, but I also saw love for me and forgiveness. From that moment forward, whatever happened, I was his. When he smiled at me and I realized he loved me and I loved him, it felt like I was the only one that he had ever created. You know, there was that instant connection and you'll all go through that. You are his child. You are his child. You are his child. And, and what he wants is for you to know him and love him and trust him and then walk through this life daily with him so that you can experience more and more of his joy. And all he needs is your willingness, your heart. Have you ever given him your heart? Have you ever just said, God, I want what Jesus did on the cross to count for me. I want your forgiveness and your leadership. And maybe you have, maybe you've wandered from him. Well, come back, you know, and start walking with him daily. Because I guarantee he is what you want. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for stretching our imagination to understand that you're greater than we've ever conceived in every way. And God, some of us never knew that relationship with you is a gift you want to give us that we have to receive. And if that's you and you want relationship with God tonight, just right now in your heart, tell him, God, I want what Jesus did to count for me. I want your forgiveness and leadership. And God, thank you. You tell us that is all you need to never leave us or forsake us. And God, some of us have, we've turned away from you, even though we know that, and, and we want to turn back right now, God, and, and commit to walking closer to you every day just like you told Santosh you want, relationship, 365 days a year, just being honest. And thank you, God, that you have so many good things in store for us. There's nothing we've ever loved about this life that you haven't already given, and there's so much more yet to come. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Hey. You know, that, that's so moving because hearing things from people who've experienced something that are consistent, it just resonates with us. You know, there, there's, there wasn't irrefutable data that was shared today. There wasn't things you could go tell somebody about and, and they wouldn't have, well, yeah, but what about, there wasn't, I don't know if you could want a debate today with a Christopher Hitchens or something like that, but you know what I know? I know there's some people in here right now who know. That's what I know. And what all those folks have experienced is a sense of boldness that changed them. And you start your walk with Christ with a moment of boldness, not a passive belief, but a moment of boldness that marks you as being different. 
So I, I don't know the last time I've done this, but what we're gonna do is right now. I'm gonna give you a chance to be bold and have God see you right now and step over the line and mark your future. And if you've never done that, if you've never given your life, your life to Christ, I want you to stand right now, right now, come on, come on. I know there's somebody in here, there's people who are bold here right now, come on, that's right. Of course there'll be a young man. Of course there'll be a bold young man. It's not your emotions, dude, come on, who else is bold in here? Who wants it, yes you do. Yes, you do want a mess, yes, come on. Who else? Who else wants to cross over in here? Yeah, you do, of course you do. Why wouldn't you? Everything else you know is untrue relative to this truth. Everything else you know, there's nothing as real as this or as important as this. Now for all of us who have stood and went around, just put your hand towards them. I we'll pray for you and those of you who are standing, those of you who are standing right now, just say something like this, God. Jesus, I want you now. I ask you, forgive me. I give you my life. And I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I'll follow you as best I can. Amen. 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 All right. Grab a seat. Well done. Welcome to the family. Your life review just got different. Now, uh, there's others of us who walked in here, we're, uh, we were stale. Very stale. The world does that to all of us. I'm sitting over there and I've got tears in my eyes because, you know, it, uh, the purity and the, the rawness and the simplicity and the uh, visceral nature of these experiences that my, line up the Bible, it's, it's like, it's like shakes up my cobwebs. Like, oh my gosh, I keep getting carried away with things I shouldn't get carried away with. I just wonder if you've just gotten stale and you want the God of heaven to see you and to know that you're going to a different place, you need a moment of boldness too. I just ask you to Boldly stand right now. Let me pray for you. Stand right now. Come on now. Come on. That's right. Come on. God's just excited about what's happening in you as anybody before because he loves you and he's for you and he's with you and he's died for you. So here we go. Let's pray right now. God, God, I ask right now to say this. God, I ask right now, refresh me. And I turn from the things that delude me. I want the scales off of my eyes and off my heart. I want you and only you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Mm. Hey, how about, uh, I'll be out of key, but we'll pick it up. How about, um, anything that's good, that's good comes from you. Anything that's good, it's good comes from you. Why don't we stand and sing this together? If all and I have, have is just the breath you gave, I'm giving it to you. Anything that's good, that's good comes from you. We'll sing it again. Lord, anything that's good, that's good comes from you, my creator. Anything that's good. This good comes from you. If all I have is just the breath you gave, I'm giving it to you. Oh, anything that's good, that's good comes from you. Cause you're the Alpha, the Omega. You're the author, the creator. You stand alone. And you are righteous, full of justice. And in the valley, you are with us. You stand alone. Lord, you're the living God. We receive you, because you're the Savior, the Redeemer, the living water. You're the healer. You stand alone. You're the
more time, one more time in the anything. One more time in the anything. All right, let's sing anything that's good. Anything that's good, that's good comes from you. Anything that's good, that's good comes from you. If all I have is just the breath you gave, I'm giving it to you. Anything that's good, that's good comes from you. Amen.